How is everybody? Yeah. Welcome to an evening with Spirit of Eden. It's wonderful to have everybody here and I'm very excited uh, to be joined by some special guests this evening to be able to take us through uh, both in real time and also uh, in a more macro sense this wonderful album. Out of interest, who here is uh, familiar with this particular record? And who would class themselves as, as intimately familiar with this record? <laughs> And who has not heard the record before? Okay, brilliant. So you've got some people that you can pounce on afterwards to see what they thought and why they haven't heard it before and ask them all those kinds of questions. Because that, that really is one of those records, isn't it, that kind of brings out that response. It's kind of a simultaneous excitement and a scandal. What? You haven't heard it? But you're really happy about that as well because you get to be the one to show them. And then always there's the, afterwards there's the, uh, the jealousy. I'm so envious that you get to hear it for the first time. Oh, I wish I could hear it for the first time. Um, but to be honest, listening to it on this wonderful sound system will be a little bit like listening to it for the first time. Um, and there is always a, a different atmosphere with listening in such a focused way. Uh, so it's brilliant to be here with uh, David Shepard on sound, who's been doing some wonderful things with Immersive Fields uh, and album playbacks on this brilliant sound system from D&B here in the Good Shed. Um, my name is William Stokes. I'm a musician in a band called Vocal Gentle and also a writer with uh, Sound on Sound and Electronic Sound and I contribute occasionally to uh, Music Tech and The Guardian, The Financial Times when they need somebody particularly nerdy um, to chime in on certain things about music and music production. But it's definitely uh, in my capacity as a musician that I'm here this evening because this album has had a profound effect on me and my output over the years. I remember very clearly the first time I heard it. Um, I was at my friend's flat in West London, and I think we'd had a few beers, and we came back to his place, and he said, oh, have, you, have you heard this record? My talk talk, Spirit of Eden. And I said, no, I hadn't. And then exactly the response I just described, what? <laughs> what? You haven't heard it? Sit down. And, uh, and you know what happens next, the soundscape, that guitar, and then the drums. And then from there I was sold. And, and it really is the intro, and we'll talk about the intro in a little bit, because it's the intro that, uh, in my opinion, often is the thing that cements the iconic status of an album, whether it's Abbey Road, or Dark Side of the Moon, or Brothers in Arms, Graceland, all of these albums, you all, as I was listing them just then, you could all imagine the intros in your heads, couldn't you? And in, this <laughs> and in the same way, uh, it's so in Spirit of Eden. And I think that for musicians, it's something that, out of interest, who here does make music? Okay, see, that's interesting, right? That's a good third of the people in here. And I think that one of the things that makes this particular record so interesting for musicians is that it's very hard to describe and it's very hard to recommend. Because if you try and describe it with words, it kind of sounds terrible. You know, what, what is it? Well, it's kind of experimental jazz rock. <laughs> you know, it's, well, it's kind of, but it's a bit more woodwind than you'd think. Um, there's some bowed guitar in there, oh, you know, you kind of just have to listen to it. And that's why when, uh, for example, when Mark Hollis died in 2019, a lot of people came out of the woodwork in really interesting ways, saying how much they were influenced by it, like Nigel Godrich and Guy Garvey in a really lovely tribute on Six Music. Um, I even, today I got a text message from um, a friend, Emily Barker, folk musician, who uh, was going to come tonight, so I'm so sorry I couldn't make it, but thanks for introducing me to Spirit of Eden, it's mind-blowing! You know, it's, it does have that effect on people, on particularly on, uh, well, not particularly, but in my experience, uh, my limited experience on musicians. But, uh, anyway, enough about me and my relationship with it. Let's uh, get up Ben Wardle, who uh, is a resident here in Stroud, and um, with such a mysterious mythology surrounding uh, Mark Hollis and Talk Talk, when I heard that Ben was... Um, writing the biography on the man, my first response was, your funeral. But 
He has written the book, and I've read it, and it's brilliant. Uh, so let's ask him about it, get him to read a little bit from it for us. Ben Wardle, everybody. <laughs> Take a seat there. I'm going to sit here. <laughs> um, it, might, it might still be my funeral, Will. You never know. It's early, <laughs> it's early days. Um, this is an interesting one, actually, reading my own book. Um, it's just sort of, it, it makes me feel slightly ashamed in a way that I don't know all off by heart as if I, someone else <laughs> wrote it. Um, it does feel like that, you know, a bit of a gap. I just thought I'd read a short bit from the beginning to get, just to really introduce uh, the concept of me writing the book about uh, Mark. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll get straight to it. So this is the introduction, it's called The Walled Garden. When Mark Hollis died in 2019, on the hottest February day on record, his death was registered in the small market town of Heathfield in East Sussex. Two years earlier, he and Flick, his wife of over 30 years, had left London and moved just east of Heathfield to Tottingworth Park. Hidden at the end of a secluded track, the £1.8 million house they bought was a modernist steel and glass construction built in the 1990s against the crumbling wall of an old Victorian kitchen garden. Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona pavilion with an English twist. Through glass walls, Hollis could observe the glorious Sussex countryside whilst hidden from the public eye. The perfect location for someone who valued privacy so intensely. The name of the building might also function as a description of its owner, the walled garden. The limitations which Hollis applied to his private life is part of his allure. When I started interviewing for this book, shortly after the world came to a standstill in early 2020, it was immediately apparent that a biography of Mark Hollis was not a new idea. That's the book we're all waiting to read, a BBC arts journalist told me. And other writers I spoke to, all with weightier track records than my own, had already considered, and in at least one case, even started work on Hollis biographies. But none of these projects had got off the ground because of the wall that Hollis had built around himself and the adoption of that wall by those close to him. The ex-members of Talk Talk and co-writer producer Tim Freeze Green had gone silent long before he died. The last time any of them spoke in detail about the band was for a 2006 Mojo feature. Any surviving older members of the Hollis family were keeping quiet. Hollis's widow is as private as her late husband was and would rather let the music speak for his legacy. Whilst his late brother Ed was friends with seemingly everyone he came into contact with, Hollis appeared to have had a solitary childhood and in adulthood would maintain, would, would maintain silence about most areas of his life, even to those who considered him close. Without the involvement of those int intimate with the subject, was there any point in writing a biography? Would writing about such a private artist be doing him, and by extension his fans, a disservice? If we learned more about the man, would it somehow lessen the impact of his music? Initially it appeared that I was destined to join the group of would-be biographers with nothing to show but notes and unreturned emails, but I persevered and gradually, largely with the help of friends who I knew from my years working in the music business, as well as a few lucky breaks, I began to chip away at Hollis's wall. And as more and more interviewees came forward, a clearer picture emerged. <clears throat> There's always a suspicion of those who value their privacy that they are perhaps hiding something. At this stage, it's important to say that there was never an intention to expose secrets, that my research was not, uh, has not revealed Hollis's privacy as a facade to cover up a darker human being. Hollis's love of silence is well documented. His most cited quotation comes from an interview he did in 1991 to promote the final Talk Talk album, Laughing Stock. The most important thing for me about my, any record is the silence. I would rather hear one note than I would two, and I would rather hear nothing than I would hear one note. He applied this silence to his own life and maintained it right up until the end. No one I interviewed ever heard him speak about his family background or private life. Those who spent days and weeks with him on tour or in the studio 
never learned anything of what was going on in his life outside the project in hand. He never gave away emotions, says engin engineer Phil Brown, who spent what amounted to years next to Hollis in the control room at Wessex Studios. We'll be hearing about that shortly. Talk Talk bassist Paul Webb admitted, I'd hate to say I knew who he was. Some alluded to, to how it was almost as if Hollis was assuming a character or donning a costume to exist in public. Despite frequent interviews during his time in the public eye, Hollis spoke candidly of music, but often sowed seeds of confusion for those whose unfortunate job it was to interrogate him. <clears throat> I'm, I'm editing as I go along, if so, so forgive me if, I, uh, if, I'm, if I hesitate a bit. Music fans in Britain used to let journalists guide our opinions. My love of pop started at the tail end of punk. If I'd heard Mark Hollis's new wave band, The Reaction, in 1978, I would probably have loved it. But when Talk Talk came along, I paid only mild attention to the eponymous single and swiftly wrote them off. Like most of the country, I'd completely forgotten about them until The Colour of Spring in 1986. And even then, as a student, I managed to ignore their return to fame, which happened against the wishes of most UK music writers. I half enjoyed Life's What You Make It on the jukebox, but owning a copy of a Talk Talk album to lean alongside R.E.M., The Smiths and Tom Waits against the skirting board of my hall of residence would not have done me any credibility favours. In my arrogant early 20s, I thought I knew everything about pop music, and in 1988, I bluffed my way into a job as a talent scout at a major label. But I knew nothing, really. I had no knowledge of classical music, let alone the modern atonal stuff, which was then inspiring Hollis. My knowledge of jazz just about reached Kind of Blue and Take Five, I loved, and indeed still love, pop music, verses and choruses with lyrics I could understand and sing along to. I was not an obvious Talk Talk fan. In winter 1988, though, I bought a cassette copy of Talk Talk's fourth album in the Lewisham branch of W.H. Smith's. I was intrigued by the cover, and also, to be frank, by the fact that it had been marked down in price. No doubt a bullish EMI sales representative had convinced Smith to stock multiple copies, assuming it would repeat the success of Colour of Spring. Henry Lowther's muted trumpet and the rustles of Martin Ditchum's experimental percussion reached me via the headphones of a Walkman, the perfect technology for listening to such intimate and intense music. I had no idea what to make of it at first, but the more I played it, the better it got. The more melodies there were, the fragmentary, dramatic details, the immersive, almost meditative quality. The apogee came a month later when, during an impromptu night drive to see my girlfriend in Suffolk, my friend Michael's old Vauxhall broke down. We sat in the, sta we sat in the stationary vehicle between Hawthorne hedges and fields, watching the sun come up to the rainbow. It remains one of the most magical listening experiences of, of, my, of my life almost as if the music was being created in real time as dawn broke. It turned out that my spirit of Eden experience was not unique. Talk, Talk Talk's fourth record appears to have been a revelatory experience for everyone who heard it, not just other fans. I heard similar stories from many Hollis collaborators I interviewed, from Adele's producer Paul Epworth to Hollywood music supervisor Brian Reitzel and Sting guitarist Dominic Miller. Everyone, it seems, had a similar Damascene experience. Phil Brown, the engineer for this and its successor Laughingstock, makes no secret that his post-talk-talk post -talk career has been largely guided by fans of these albums seeking him out. Even his enormous success with Dido came as a result of her producer Rollo's love of Spirit of Eden. And perhaps it is also the reason that you are holding this book. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Ben. So, you obviously detailed there your personal journey uh, with the band and with this album in particular, but yep. since you've um, obviously been able to get more of a, a picture of where the band was, you know, on the other side of that narrative, um, can you just give us a snapshot, I suppose, about, you know, while you were, uh, or, what, you know, while you were sort of getting used to the colour of spring, what, what was happening in the world of the band at this point? What led them up to, to take this step uh, from, you know, kind of this 
this pop sensibility into something a whole lot more uncharted? Well, that's, well, that's a big question. Um, a lot, I mean, a lot had happened in Talk Talk's career prior to this. So I'm just repositioning this microphone. There we are. Is that better? Um, so the key thing about Talk Talk is that they were absolutely massive in Europe. They, um, I kind of alluded to the, the way that in the 80s uh, and for a large part of the 90s, the British music press absolutely uh, dominated uh, m music tastes of the you know the, of, of people who claim to be interested and, uh, and passionate about music, and so uh, Talk Talk got off on the wrong foot in the UK, as I'm sure many of us in this room know. They were signed to the same label as Duran Duran. They had a double moniker, like Duran Duran. Their A and R person put them with Duran Duran's producer for their first album, and uh, to cap it all. Uh, they wore these ridiculous white suits for their photo shoot, which immediately got them lampooned by the music press and filed alongside uh, kind of new, new romantic also rands like uh, Flock of Seagulls and Blue Zoo and, and other names that probably people have fortunately forgotten. <laughs> so um, they were just not taken seriously at all. And what was fascinating about the uh, the that experience, but and, it must have been incredibly painful for Mark, is that he genuinely really did take it very seriously. And he quite seriously believed that he had the aspiration that he was tr trying to create a kind of, he had a small four piece jazz lineup. That's what he wanted. His favourite record was uh, um, A Love Supreme by John Coltrane. He, um, his brother was a huge influence musically, Ed Hollis, and he therefore had, you know, was not only familiar with kind of relatively mainstream records like Love Supreme, but was also exposed to John Abercrombie and, you know, lots of ECM jazz as well as, uh, as well as modern classical stuff, even back then while he was making um, uh, uh, Talk Talk and, um, and Such a Shame, and, uh, uh, sorry, not Such a Shame, and Today, which was the eventual record that uh, the UK public almost reluctantly made into a hit, possibly because it sounded a bit like Japan, who were doing very well at the time, and the bass, the bass line sort of has echoes of Mick Khan and that period. So they had a minor hit in the UK. They didn't do too badly with the album. They, you know, they supported Duran Duran, they went on tour, but there was all, they were always swimming against a tide of opprobrium. And, uh, uh, but meanwhile, they did really well in the States without the permission of the UK press. They, they, um, they gradually started making uh, inroads into Europe. And by the time of the second album, which everyone here I'm sure knows as uh, It's My Life, um, they were having genuine big hits. There was one point uh, in, let's get the, my years right, 1983, I think, where they had uh, Four records in the in the German top 50, four singles, um, and one of them was a was kind of a, a sort of a, a, a track from the first album, which had been used on a in, in a, a German detective series, which was very popular. Which someone had synced to that series, and, and suddenly, all of a sudden, this terrible kind of wasn't very good track, to be perfectly honest, um, was a was a hit. Was their fourth hit at the same time. So they were huge, and I think there's a you know right, even right now there's a large amount of people in Europe who kind of perceive um, Mark Hollis as a George Michael or a, or a boy George, that kind of, you know, big 80s pop star. Uh, and it's testament really to the fact that, that the music press um, were not leading people's tastes in the way that they, that, that they led people's tastes in this country. People were not, and, and I think Hollis was very aware of this and mentioned it in a number of interviews, you know, that the people were listening to the music over there rather than looking at the trousers and the haircuts and the, and, and the shoes. So by the time they got to the colour of spring, which to go back to your question, <laughs> well, by the time they got to the colour of spring, um, there was a, they were buoyed by a confidence that they really, they'd sold a lot of records. I mean, prior to It's My Life, they were a quarter of a million, a million pounds in debt to EMI and it was not looking good. By the time that album was finished, they were very much in, in the black with EMI and could, to a certain extent, do what they wanted. You know, they, they, they went off and they, and they made 
a record with no singles on it.